Wrestling Roundtable Radio is back on the air on blogtalkradio.com slash wrestlingroundtable, simulcast on wrestlingroundtable.com, and gofightlive.tv, or gofightlive.com. It'll bring you to the same place. So thank you for joining us. I'm the host, Eric Santa Maria. I've been working in wrestling a little over six years, coming up on six and a half, actually, doing a lot of different tasks, ring crew, video editing, cameraman, ring announcer, editor, commentator, much to the chagrin of ROH fans, I might add, but pfft, whatever. Either way, I've been working in wrestling a long time, and this is the latest incarnation, the host of Wrestling Roundtable. Please call in and share your thoughts, 347-857-4647, here live at 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Tuesdays, which, of course, also makes it 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, or like 4 in the morning if you're joining us in the U.K. Lots of fans in the U.K., so hello to our friends overseas. And like I said, we want to hear your thoughts and opinions or questions. You could also share them on WrestlingRoundTable.com. You can sign up for the message board and newsletter there as well. And you can also see the overhaul I did on the website. Now on the front page, it's a whole new look. I think a lot more together, a lot more interactivity and uh, connection there with YouTube, Facebook, Twitter. Hell, I even overhauled the MySpace. I don't even know why. Who the fuck uses that anymore? I mean, I didn't want to give up on our thousands of friends over there, but oh my god, that user interface and new design, MySpace, absolute fucking garbage. But if you're still one of the people who haven't jumped over to Facebook, MySpace has a new look as well. On Facebook, we have two pages, the fan page where you can like us, please do that, or the group page where you can add us and do that as well. WrestlingRoundTable.com is a lot of features in addition to the overhaul. Recaps of Plenty by Bill Treadway. Bill Treadway must have bleeding fingertips at this point. All the shows he's recapping, Raw, Superstars, pay-per-views, old DVDs, shows he's gone to. Man, Bill Treadway is writing a lot. Let's not forget, of course, of Zach Fellows, our writer over in the U.K., recapping SmackDown every week. And, of course, submissions by you. Have to catch up on that this week. There's going to be a lot more content from the fans and readers of Wrestling Roundtable. Some pay-per-view recaps that fans have submitted, as well as guest columns. While I'm in a plugging mood, Wrestling Road Diaries which, of course, stars the new NWA World Heavyweight Champion Colt Cabana, along with current United States Champion in WWE Daniel Bryan and Sal Renaro. On the road for Bryan Danielson's final countdown tour in Ring of Honor, Chikara, and other indies. And that documentary is finally going to be available, shipping on March 21st. There are pre-orders right now at WrestlingRoadDiaries.com. And each copy is autographed by Cabana and Danielson, and the two-disc edition is available for an extra $5. That would be $25. But you can get that at WrestlingRoadDiaries.com. My first documentary, and I hope you enjoy it. Beth Phoenix and CM Punk have been tweeting about it, and they've enjoyed it, so thank you for the compliments. And I'm sure that you'll like it as well. I think that's enough plugging for now. There'll be some more later, so hold tight on that. But let's introduce some of the panel members for the night. Will Brooks. Hello, Will. How have you been doing? Hello, Wrestling Roundtable Universe. Uh, it's my <sighs> never-ending quest to become the sexiest member of the uh, Wrestling Roundtable panel. I recently was in a all-male beauty pageant last week, and I, I did lose, but I had the crowd going nuts when I was staying on stage in nothing but my boxing boots. Corey, you should have saw me. It was hot. <laughs> I'm sure it was. And joining us from Chicago, our radio panelist, Coriander Ake. Hello, Cory. Hello, Eric. Hi, everyone. You can join them on the latest goings on in mixed martial arts and pro wrestling. Again, 347 857 4647. And we're going to get right down into it with mixed martial arts. And, uh, wow. UFC's latest offerings on pay per view and otherwise. Lots of controversy about them, and I'm afraid I'm on the brunt of it because uh, I happen to agree with the judges in both cases, but let's not get into that just yet. UFC 127 returning to Sydney, Australia in the Acer Arena. Last year, it seemed like UFC brought pride to Australia with lots of former pride fighters. This time, Michael Bisping, the middleweight, defeated Jorge Rivera in the second round via TKO in punches, but that was not the real story of this fight. 
Michael Bisping, notorious for his attitude and pretty much playing the heel for mixed martial arts fans. Oh, boy. Even though he won in the second round by TKO, I think this could have been an easy disqualification because of what he did in round one, as you probably know if you follow mixed martial arts. But if you're a, as Corey likes to say, newbie, you might not know that one of the rules, the unified rules, at least here in America, is that you cannot throw a knee to a downed opponent if they're on their knees or have their hands on the canvas or mat. Cannot throw a knee, and you can see sometimes how that might happen by accident in the heat of the battle, but that's not what I saw this time. I think that was a very intentional. He knew that he was throwing an illegal kick. Michael Bisping nailed Jorge Rivera in the head, made him woozy for a little bit. Rivera continued and survived that round, the first round, but ate a lot of punches towards the end of it. And frankly, even though the announcers are saying he recovered, I did not get that impression. I think that in the second round, it really showed that he was still reeling from that kick. I don't think he ever recovered and, again, could not survive the onslaught in the second round. And that's not where the story ended either. Michael Bisping spitting over at the corner of Rivera and his managers and whoever's defending Bisping saying that they made it personal and they deserved it. But Dana White, the president of UFC, not thrilled with, I guess, the overall actions of Michael Bisping that night. And I have to agree, I would not have been upset if that was a disqualification loss for Bisping in the first round because I think that uh, knee warranted it. But let's see what you think, Will Brooks. What do you think about Michael Bisping and his latest antics that have seemed to raise the ire of Chell Sonnen, who pretty much called him out afterwards? Before I get to that, I just want to mention a uh, quick about George Sotopoulos going home to Australia and losing after being on a seven-fight uh, win streak. He was getting a good push, and now it looks like he just fell dead in his tracks. He lost, and he, he lost conventionally. But mm-hmm. now back to Ben's game. I don't know why you're upset. This is what the heels do. Eric, they cheat. They get away with it. They've been doing pro wrestling for years. Mixed martial arts is just catching up now. Yeah, but, but you're talking about it as if it was a work, and it's not. This is a I, real sport I, with someone's health on the line. I know. I'm just making it up. But, um, no, I mean, I hear <laughs> okay. you saying. Was the knee illegal? Yes. But you, should, you, get a, you get a warning for those things. That's fine. And no, 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 no. I, I disagree there. This is not a situation like Lesnar's first fight with Mir where I thought that was bullshit when uh, the referee stopped and took away a point immediately without a warning because I don't think that Lesnar was intentionally hitting the back of Mir's head. This looked intentional to me. Well, Mir fought a couple of when he turned. He, like, he purposely turned into it. So to me, that was that wasn't the Brock Lesnar being uh, immature or anything like that. That was Mir looking like an idiot. With Rivera, yeah, well, point being uh, that it wasn't intentional. Yeah, but like you know, whether it's pencil or not, you really can't prove that, you know. So well, it sure as hell looked it. You gotta get. Yeah, I always have to give the warning. I mean, box guys box for like twenty years and they still headbutt. I mean, come on, you gotta give the warning. It's whatever it happens. But as far as what happened after, I mean, he, he did legitimately win the next round. So, but was he still woozy? He might have been. I mean, it's kind of hard to say. Mm-hmm. But I will say this though: after the fight, when I was I uh, did I like what Vince didn't know. I understand if the guy talks, a guy gets really personal with you, you want to really get stick it to him, which I can understand. But at the same time, have some class. And now he wants to be known as the biggest asshole in UFC since Chill Sunday's so gone. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> that, that role is open. Well, it looks like he's on the fast track to claiming that prize. And I don't think this thing's necessarily known in his UFC run, at least, as a, the classiest fighter either. But that being said, do you think that a possible grudge match, I guess, with uh, Sonnen and Bisping, where Sonnen called him out afterwards and said he'd love to give him what's coming to him, do you think that's a proper way to go? Because I guess some people look at it like this could be Sonnen's redemption for his uh, testosterone suspension. Well, I mean, if Sonnen comes back and Bisping's not in line for a title shot, then yeah, sure what the hell. Because Sonnen barely lost to Silver, even though he was on steroids. And Bisping, you know, he just won something. I could, if they want to do that, I'm all for it, and I'd love to see it. But, only, but if Bisping's in line for a title shot, and they decide, no, let's next day that and give it, give him something instead, well, then I'll be, even though I don't like Bisping, I think that's a little unfair. Well, some people were saying that they should just feed Bisping to Anderson Silva because it's uh, pretty much the majority opinion that Anderson Silva would tear through him and give him what's coming to him. But, I mean, uh, I don't see Bisping as being worthy of stepping in the ring with the champion just yet so far. 
Well, I, you know, every time I feel really pissed off about victory, you know what I do? I watch his fight against Henderson over again. Well, he got knocked the fuck out. It was great. I was in the bar watching that Hooters. I was and, in the uh, arena. Oh, man, he gave that killer right hand, went went down, and then he gave him that hammer shot just to, for good measure. The whole bar went, was going nuts, and we all started chanting, USA, USA. <laughs> well, we'll be talking about Dan Henderson a little later on, but the main event of 127 in Australia was BJ Penn returning to welterweight and facing John Fitch. Now, this was the second month in a row, not second show in a row, but second month in a row that... There was a draw in a UFC main event. Now, unfortunately, and I know I'm in probably in the minority here because most people seem to believe that Fitch won the fight. And frankly, if they had announced that Fitch won by split decision or unanimous decision maybe even, I don't think that would have been that big of a stretch. However, my score at home happened to match the score of two of the judges, and that was 28-28. I gave BJ Penn the first two rounds. 10-9, and then Fitch dominated him so badly in that third round, at least in my opinion and the two judges' opinions, that it was a 10-8 round. That adds up to 28-28. So unfortunately, even though my score matched the judges in this case, like I said, this is the second show in January and February where there's been a main event in UFC that has ended in a draw, and in doing so, screwed up the title contention. As we know, Gray Maynard and Frankie Edgar for the lightweight belt in January – in Vegas on the 1st, the winner was supposed to face Anthony Pettis, WEC's last lightweight champion in a unification match, and that got fucked. So they're going to do a rematch there. Now, in this case, some people have been suggesting that if George St. Pierre can defend his welterweight championship yet again against Jake Shields in a couple weeks, or actually in a, next month, that GSP should vacate the welterweight belt, move up to middleweight, challenge Anderson Silva, we get our dream match, and then BJ Penn and John Fitch's rematch can be for the belt to crown a new champion. So what do you think about that scenario, Will, and specifically this decision, this majority draw that happened against BJ Penn and John Fitch? Get ready for a rant right here. And with all the draws <laughs> that are going on that are screwing up the championship thing, even draws in general I'm not usually a big fan of. No Why one is, really. Know? Why why wouldn't the UFC institute a plan for if a fight has a draw after like it's you know, it's a draw, why not have like an a sudden death overtime of like say it's just a quick two minute round? Now at first glance a lot of people say, Well that gives a whole lot of advantage to the strikers. But actually I don't think so, because if you think about it, if you're a good wrestler, all you have to do is take the guy down and just lay on top of him, maybe give him a couple punches and you win that two for two minutes and you win right. that. The only people I really hurt are really submission experts. Who, who people like that's the whole game of submission. That could hurt them the most, granted. But if you're in the UFC, you better have something else up your sleeve. So I sort of think, I mean, especially for a title fight, I mean, I really feel just two minutes wouldn't really be all that bad. Most of these guys, look, I mean, there are except, exceptions. I've seen some guys, some wars. But in fact, I think that's what's appropriate. You know, you do that in every other sport. I think it fits. But another thing, what sucks about the BJ Penn Fitch fight, it kind of makes the welterweight division look kind of weak. Since GSP kicks the shit out of Jake Shields, which he probably will, if he doesn't move up, then who's going to take this crown? It's going to lack everything for the welterweight division. Everybody's going to look at it like, why the hell should I give a shit anymore about this whole division? Because of this draw, GSP might not move up because of that. The UFC might not let him move up. They might want to keep him in that division a little longer just to give it some star power so people can actually still care. Uh, I suppose. I mean... That's the reason. I mean, I had that uh, Right, right, right. But I'm just saying that let's say BJ won the fight. Would people really be wanting to see GSP defeat him again? Especially at this point in his career, Baby J, that's a, a, an appropriate nickname because it just seems like every time he loses, he just, oh my God, I might retire. I don't know. It just come on, man, suck it up. I mean, he was winning those first two rounds, in my opinion. And he was doing pretty well, of course, coming off the knockout, real quick knockout victory over Matt Hughes last year, too. Now this happens. And if you've read the news on WrestlingRoundTable.com lately, and you should, you would have seen that a few months ago that the California State Athletic Commission is going to be testing out a new way to score, at least in amateur fights. They're going to be testing out a new way to score mixed martial arts in California this year, and what they'll be doing is for amateur bouts, they'll be scoring it the unified way, the normal way, and then this new way that takes into account more mixed martial arts related things that we're familiar with that see, a lot of people were criticizing just 
a couple months ago, especially with that Nam Fan Leonard Garcia decision, the judging in mixed martial arts itself. Now the big criticism is the scoring in mixed martial arts itself. And should there be sudden death? Should there be this? And I think we're really just seeing the growing pains of mixed martial arts because as the sport grows, there's going to be problems like this encountered and hopefully ways to solve it. And if that new scoring system in California works out, they're going to implement it and use whichever works better, actually, and then use it for professional fights. And hopefully it'll spread from there because, I mean, I also think there's a lot of goofy rules uh, in mixed martial arts, uh, especially when they show best of pride. Oh, that makes me so sad. I love pride. I love Japan because, man, I'd love to see them implement yellow cards for lack of activity, flying stomps and soccer kicks back and the like. But either way, it just seems like people are criticizing how the sport is actually functioning, how it's actually structured now. And uh, that's just one example. We're going to get to another one in a little bit because uh, the next UFC event was on versus on versus three the third event on versus although it could have been on versus 3d because they had their first 3d experiment which i unfortunately did not see i would have loved to have seen ufc in 3d but they only announced it a few days before the show and i don't even know if i get the network i think it was their first show in louisville kentucky at the kfc young center unbelievable this uh first occurrence bantamweight brian bowles Defeating Demacio Page by guillotine in the third round. I'm sorry, in the first round, three minutes and 30 seconds into the third round, a technical submission he did not tap. But what makes that so unbelievable is that this is a rematch from their original fight in 2008, which ended the exact same way with the exact same hole. Difference being this time he did not actually tap out. Maybe he was just like, oh, no, not again, and he refused to because uh, he passed out. The ref stopped it. But as the announcer said, lightning striking twice. What are the chances of that in mixed martial arts, Will? That's very slim. But before I get more on Brian Bowles, I want to say it's, I really feel really sad for Joe Guy Stevenson being regulated to Facebook preliminary card before the fight. Mm-hmm. I feel kind of bad for him because I think he's a talented guy. Who just got, who just ended up beat, getting beat by really really talented really talented guys who were better than him. But oh well. But back to Brian Bowles. Brian Bowles is a real talent dude. But like he, mm-hmm. I mean, he, he was the guy who beat Miguel Torres when Miguel Torres was on an 18 fight winning streak. He's got power. He's good stuff. His only loss was as a ref stoppage because he broke his hand. So he never really should have lost that fight to uh, Cruz or the title to Cruz, I should say. Like you were saying, it does suck to lose the same fight the same way and to the same guy. That's gotta be like that's gotta like eat away at him. If I just stayed away from that one fucking move, I could have beat him. What the hell? You know, it, was <laughs> it definitely pissed me off a lot, too. So I feel for the guy. Middleweight, Mark Munoz defeated C.B. Dalloway really quickly in 54 seconds with a TKO. Really stunned him, knocked him down. And I don't know, at first there seemed to be a little discrepancy with the ref stoppage. Everyone's saying Mario Yamasaki, as Joe Rogan repeated many times, is not the guy to stop the fight early. And upon the replay, it did look like, yeah, I guess he made the right call. But as it happened, I don't know, I, I kind of got the impression he could have survived a little longer. Or maybe he was getting up a little bit. What do you think about that, Will? Yes, it sucks to have ref stoppages like that quickly. But sometimes it's better to hit on the safe side of caution, man. You know, you, mm-hmm. it's better to do that than have these guys get hit in the head one too many times. But that being right. said, I, get, I don't get what, why the UFC has pushed C.B. Dalloway like they did after, after he lost in the ultimate fighter. They, mm-hmm. they, right after the fact, they really pushed him hard, and he just never looked all that great to me. I, I couldn't understand why they did that so much. I know, I know they like their wrestlers, especially wrestlers who have um, credentials like he does, but I really don't see it. I don't see why they like him, and I hope they stop like really, really pushing him until he deserves it. Well, if there's one thing I can't see, it's that why I'm the only person, it seems, that agrees with the decision in the main event. Welterweight Diego Sanchez looking a lot thicker than I'm used to. I'm uh, not used to him having that shaved head and looking so big. They they were saying chunky, but uh, I enjoy watching Diego Sanchez fight. I can't say I'm a huge fan, especially with all the Jesus Christ shit. But either way, it's kind of like how people like Clay Guida, you always know you're going to get an exciting fight. Win or lose, I always feel like I get that out of Diego Sanchez. So I look forward to his fights, and I look forward to this one. However... It was unanimous decision, Diego Sanchez defeating Martin Kampman. Everyone else seems to be saying that Martin Kampman won the fight. Now, I scored it 
uh, the first round for Campman. He was using his technical boxing, as they called it, and obviously opened up Diego and scored a lot more damage. But I believe in the second round that Diego, maybe his striking isn't as uh, smooth as Campman, but I think he really opened him up as well. In that third round, I think it was Diego too. So maybe I'm just uh, the only person who agreed with it besides the judges, I guess. So before I go any further, let's see what you think, Will. It was a very, very close fight. In fact, it's one of those rare times that they would have called it a draw. I would have been like, you know what? I kind of see it. But mm-hmm. I'm sorry to disagree. I would give it to Cameron. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was close, though. The chance of winning does not piss me off because it was close. But if yeah. I was a judge, I probably would have given that last round to Cameron. See, this is probably where they need to relook at the scoring system. I was never really a huge fan on the 10-point must scoring system, and here's why. That was a very close fight. And what's the score for a close round if you give it to one person? 10-9, right? Well, that's the score you give it to someone who just maybe barely edged out someone. But yet, what's the score for a round where someone got totally fucking dominated? 10-8? You know, it's only a one-point difference? Uh, I think they really need to look at that. Well, the problem with that is, like, what if you have one shit round where you get your ass kicked, and, you, and, and under your idea, it would be like, what, 10-6 or something like that? The next mm-hmm. rest of the fight, you kick the guy's ass. I mean, you still have to make up for that six. I mean, some guys start slowly, or some guys get caught, and you know, you, they, you should, they shouldn't be punished for getting caught once in the first round, but just dominating the rest of the fight. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, and I'm glad, even though you thought Campman won. By the way, both fighters medically suspended indefinitely. Campman broke his right hand, as we saw, and Diego Sanchez looked like an old melted-down E.T. puppet afterwards or something. He was barely barely recognizable. But that being said, I'm glad that even though you thought Campman won, you didn't say what people have been saying. I've been reading it a lot, and it really fucking annoys me. Well, look at Diego Sanchez. Did he look like the winner? What the fuck does that have to do with anything? I think back to one of the earlier main events in UFC, Tank Abbott versus Don Fry. It was very short, but very explosive. Tank Abbott looked like he was fucking murdering Don Fry. Punches that opened up Fry's face. Don Fry beat Tank Abbott by submission. Fry came back, and uh, even though he was all bloody and beaten, maybe not as bad as uh, Diego Sanchez and the like, but he came back and won. So even though he was a bloody mess, he was still the winner. So even though afterwards it looked like Tank Abbott sure won based on who was bloody and everything. People were saying the same shit about this. It just doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't matter what he looked like. What actually happened in the fight? Somebody like once told me. Actually, it was a former cop who once told me. You know who? You know how you can tell who wins a fight? Look on. The, look at them the next day. But mm-hmm. again, I don't think that really applies to mixed martial arts. Though something I just thought of when you said that. The other side of that. Remember that sometimes when a guy looks like shit and he gets like in cuts and everything, they got to call the fight, even if it's not a bad cut. Or it's not. But I've seen these guys' facing swelling up so bad, they had, like, I think they should have called it. Like, um, Tito Ortiz, when he fought Ken Shamrock, and, he, and Ken Shamrock took about, like, 30 knees to the head. He, or I think he Fedor, that. as we just saw. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, totally. I remember, like, after, I kind of watched that fight halfway through the first time I saw it, and I had no idea that was Ken Shamrock. His, he did not look recognizable. That's how much right. his face swelled. To the point where I was thinking, why do they keep letting him fight? Like, Jesus Christ. Brock Lesnar, Shane Carmen, how bad did Brock Lesnar look in that first fight, that first round? Mm-hmm. He, he he was bloodied up and everything. And then, of course, look what happened. You know, so you can't, it's kind of hard to do that. Lastly, on mixed martial arts, this past weekend, Strike Force Viejo versus Hendo, Dan Henderson. The fight I wanted to talk about before that was women's welterweight champion Marlos Kunin defeating Liz Carmouche. I was looking forward to this because. I have been talking to some uh, people lately about my opinion, and uh, speaking of women's MMA, we'll get to uh, Gina Carano in a little bit, because we did not talk about her last time when we talked about Strike Force and IZOD in East Rutherford, New Jersey, that we went to, but back to Marlos Kunin. And her fight specifically, I, I guess you could kind of make the analogy that it was almost the female version of Anderson Silva and Charles Sonnen where the champion was just being dominated so badly. The announcers were hyping that Kunin had some wrestling trainers for this fight, but didn't look like it at all to me because Carmouche was taking her down and passing guard and just completely dominating her. It almost looked like if those punches were really getting through, I mean, Kunin had some good defense, so they weren't doing too much damage, but it was just 
a, I don't want to say a slaughter, but other dominance from uh, Carmouche, definitely on her way to winning the title, when all of a sudden, out of nowhere in the fourth round, uh, Carmouche took her down and was in the right position for a triangle choke, and Kunin survived, and she needed to. She needed to get that move in because she was definitely losing. She needed something dramatic to happen. She made it happen in the fourth round, submitted Carmouche to a triangle, and what I've been talking to people about lately is how I really feel how Dana White missed the boat on women's MMA. Of course, there were some rumors last week unsubstantiated and thus denied by WWE, so pretty much untrue. It seems more like a negotiating tactic. Rumor was that WWE had offered Christian Cyborg Santos, the pretty much top woman MMA fighter in the world, a contract. Doesn't look like that's true, but Cyborg's whole thing may have been that she's just been upset about the lack of competition. And even though they just brought back Gina Carano onto TV, I doubt that she's going to be much of a challenge this time. I think it would, if there was a rematch, I think it would end up the same way. But what I'm getting at with uh, women's MMA is that I really think Dana White missed the ball on this. You see so much international expansion with UFC this year. They want to go to Netherlands and Japan. They'll be going to Brazil. There's been so many firsts uh, as far as first in this state, first in that state. They want to go to Sweden. And part of their international expansion plans incorporating the later weight divisions from WEC is to do ultimate fighter in different countries. They're targeting Philippines. They want to add the flyweight, 125 pounds. They've already added bantamweight and featherweight. So you would think that, yes, as Dana White has said, there's a huge problem with women's mixed martial arts, and that is that there isn't a deep talent pool. Well, what better way to create that than Ultimate Fighter? Imagine if they had nabbed, after Elite XC folded, Gina Carano and Cyborg Santos, and those were coaches for Ultimate Fighter leading up to a big fight as it was – because that was, I believe, Strike Force's highest drawing fight pretty much ever. I think that was their most viewed. And in addition to the big Carano Cyborg fight, you would have probably created some stars in the process. What do you think about women's MMA, Will? Well, first off, I want to talk about Marlis Cohen for a little bit. Mm-hmm. First off, I love her. And for no, for no other reason than the fact that she's from my home country, the Netherlands. Go, <laughs> go Dutch. Just like I love Alistair Overman and his little brother. Anyway. Mm-hmm. But in fact, what you said about women's MMA, yes, it is. Is it a little um, thin? Yes, it is a little thin. I mean, I, you know, it sucks, but it is thin. But which I actually kind of liked your idea of that having Carano and Santos do a um, Ultimate Fighter. That would have been cool, though. But mm-hmm. I will say that, and I and I told you this before, Gina Carano did not do a bad job against Santos. Okay, I know you say she got her ass kicked. She did not get her ass kicked. She landed a clean shot against Santos. She took down Santos, and you know what? And, what, and when she took it down, she got right back up. She should have stayed on top of it and, and punched her in the face, but she didn't do it. And she was only one second away from going to the second round. And I told you that I think her plan was to outlast her, because Santos has never gone past a round and a half. So I still think Gina Carano could still beat her. But honestly, I think Santos would win. But I still think Carano has a good chance. But that being said, yes, it's still thin. They need to get the word out to the women fighters out there to, to start learning how to wrestle. They need to start getting in the cage. Well, I'll tell you what, when we were shooting Grappling Kings the past, I guess, two years at this point, when's that fucking thing ever coming out? But when we were shooting the Grappling Kings the other year, myself and Rodney LeConte, he and his brother Martin were competing and shooting a lot of different grappling tournaments in the tri-state area, primarily New Jersey, New York, Grapplers Quest, Naga, Abu Dhabi, etc. And there's a lot of women grapplers out there who are pretty good. And, of course, that's more jiu-jitsu and uh, ground-based, uh, per se, not necessarily mixed martial arts. That would be mixing it up with, of course, Muay Thai and stand-up and lots of other disciplines, of course. But I, I guess I've just seen it more than some people sitting at home, I guess. In that sense, I've seen the, the real women's athletes out there doing it of different ages and whatnot. But, like I said, yeah, it's a problem that there's not that many names. I mean, I didn't know much about Liz Carmouche before she got this title shot. I mean, you look her up, she's got a good record and blah, blah, blah. But again, they need to start making stars. And I think a real easy solution to the problem of there not being stars and not being familiar with a lot of these fighters would have been that show. So I guess now we're on the subject. One thing we didn't talk about at the 
Strike Force Bigfoot versus uh, Fedor card was that they presented out of nowhere a surprise Gina Carano coming back to mixed martial arts after being gone for almost two years after getting her ass handed to her by Cyborg. Not I, don't, her ass handed to her. I don't see how you could say a first round TKO isn't getting her ass kicked, but I'll, I'll still have to rewatch the fight. Well, watch the fight again, and let me tell you right now, Gina Carano's still hot as hell. Well, I didn't dispute that. She certainly no, is. I just, want to, I just want to say that. That's all. She may be hot, but she sounded dumb as shit <laughs> because that interview segment was just so fucking lame. And as high as we were on Strike Force that night, I think the heavyweight tournament was going real well. Lots of first round stoppages and knockouts, and the heavyweights looked really good. But then in the middle of this, Gina Carano's coming back. No specific time or opponent. She's just coming back sometime, and let's get some words from her. <laughs> it, it was just pretty much embarrassing. What would you think of that whole segment, Will? I wasn't really looking at her mouth too much. I was kind of looking at the whole package, so I wasn't really paying attention to what she was saying at all. Mm-hmm. But I will say this, though. I, I was excited to see her back in the game because she is a legitimately good fighter. It's not like she's just a pretty face. She's legitimately good. But it is kind of stupid how they didn't even mention when she can come back. They should at least had a fight ready for her, like, hey, I'm coming back at such and such strike force date against so and so. You know what I mean? The fact that they said, hey, she's here, she'll be back soon, it's kind of like, well, that's like, can you at least give me a, like a date? Can I see something here, please? Typical strike force. And yes, Gina. it would have been nice. <laughs> it would have been nice to have a date with Gina Carano. But let's God. move on to the main event. Your man, Hendo, Dan Henderson, adding to his already impressive MMA resume at the age of 40. A stellar career after being an Olympic uh, wrestler, going on to UFC, rings, pride, now strike force, just all over the place, and adding another belt, the light heavyweight championship, when he defeated Rafael Fejo Cavalcante in the third round with a TKO. In the first round, it... Oh, that was kind of scary. Looked like he might have gotten knocked out right at the beginning with that right hand by Cavalcante, but uh, he survived, which was cool, of course. And uh, the second round was a lot more competitive, but bam, knocked him out in the third round, TKO. So I know you've got a lot to say about Dan Henderson winning the light heavyweight title, but uh, we've also got to talk about his next challenger potentially after that, but I'll let you go first, Will. Let me ask you a question, Eric. Who is the best American mixed martial artist of all time? Off the top of my head, I'd love to say Randy Couture, but I'm sure you're going to make an argument. You know what? Randy Couture is the only guy I would definitely say I would succumb to in this case. But to tell you the truth, I I think it might be Randy Couture, but I'm going to say you can make a definitely great case for Kendo. Got to make a, a Team Quest pick, I guess. He had a great wrestling career at Arizona State. And let me tell you, Arizona State is like a mixed martial arts factory. Him, you got Dan Severn, Dan Velasquez, you got Ryan Bader. I think there's more. I'm, just, I'm missing some. That, I mean, it's a mixed martial arts factory right there. Mm-hmm. Then, and you got the fact that he was able to translate that and succeed very well. I mean, he actually was one of the rare guys who actually looked good against Anderson Silva. You know, he actually had a great career in Japan, pride champion, kicked a lot of ass, came to his UFC, became a UFC champion. I'm pretty, right? He became a UFC champion, correct? He won a tournament, if you count that. I'll Back in the it. days before they had uh, real belts and whatnot. Kind of like how Ken Shamrock won some super fights and whatnot. Works for me. And now he's a light heavyweight champion. He's like the Legion of Doom of mixed martial arts. He's had a great career. He has, he's had knockouts. He's had submission wins. He's had t- refs out to TKOs. Every time he lost, he never really got his ass kicked. He's had a great career. And he's 40. He's still doing it. I love how these old, all these wrestlers from the old age are still like, kicking a lot of ass. But, yeah, if it's not him, it's Randy Couture. It's the best American mixed martial artist of all time. You can make a case for Chuck Liddell, but I think he was a little more much of a kind of one-trick pony, but he's, he's up there, too, though. When we did the show last time, we talked about the Strike Force event we attended with Fedor's second loss ever, and put a damper on what up until then was a really good show, and had a lot of talk about Fedor, but one thing I forgot to bring up is that afterwards, Strike Force CEO Scott Coker all of a sudden comes out with... Oh, by the way, Fedor is going to be a alternate first pick. What the fuck is this shit? We just saw an undercard of some awesome fights, like Chad Griggs, Valentin Overeem, and Shane Del Rosario, all winning in pretty decisive fashion to be alternates 
and Fedor is going to jump the line after his second loss in a row. I mean, could it be more obvious that Coker just wants to save this fucking pony and get him back in there as soon as possible? Once we start praising Strike Force for something, I was a big fan of the tournament idea. All this stuff starts happening, and then they delayed the second show that was going to feature the tournament. It was going to be coming up on April 9th, I believe. And if you give me a second, I will get you the specific details from WrestlingRoundTable.com. It was supposed to be on April 9th in Columbus, Ohio, and that was supposed to feature the Overeem, Verdum, and Brett Rogers Barnett bouts. But then they delayed it all of a sudden to June 18th, their excuse being, well, the show in IZOD was so successful. We want to really capitalize on that and prepare properly, and it just wasn't enough time. It's too soon. Really? That sounds like bullshit in lieu of trying to get the card in a state where Barnett would get licensed. They moved it to Texas, which kind of has a infamous state athletic commission that kind of doesn't know what it's doing and just doesn't really do drug testing and shit. Hmm. I don't know if it's a coincidence now that Barnett's going to be fighting in Texas in several more months instead of coming up rather soon. That's going to happen on June 18th now. So a lot of weird shit going on with the tournament after the fact, after a good first show. But now things seem to have changed again, and here's where it's going to connect. Well, apparently, as some people have been suggesting that he do, rumor is that Strike Force has approached Fedor and Henderson about a fight together for the light heavyweight title. Now, a lot of people have been saying Fedor should drop weight, he should just try and do this new venture, he's a smaller heavyweight, so it wouldn't be that much of a stretch, and it might be the better thing to do. However, you'd be giving a title shot, and it would be a super fight in a sense, because Fedor is obviously still a name, but you would be giving a super fight to a guy who just lost twice, rather badly in a row, and Dan Henderson ain't exactly a spring chicken anymore either. I mean, he looked great, but Jake Shields really got him off to a bad start in strike force. Luckily, he's recovered, and he's looked good in his last couple fights. But uh, what do you think about that potential matchup, Fedor and Hendo? Before I get to that, I just want to say that I told you this before. I, I still think the Russian mob has got something on Fedor's family or whatever. They're threatening to kill him or something if he retires. Because for some reason, I think the guy really wants out but just can't get out. Mm. But... A match against Henderson, yeah, I mean, I'd want to see that, but do I, do I really care about it? Not at all. Like, Fedora, I love Fedora. He had a great career, but I loved uh, Ric Flair, too, and it's getting pretty <laughs> old, and I loved Hulk Hogan, and it's pretty fucking old. You know, it's the same thing in mixed martial arts. you got to know when to call it a day, and he tried to, I think. And I think again, Somehow I don't think Fedor does as much coke as Hulk and Flair. I hope he, he saved his money instead of doing that, but hey. <laughs> I think he really does want to retire, and they just won't let him. The guy really doesn't want to fight. He's not giving you good fights anymore. He really actually, I think he's just bringing the company down at some point, you know? And especially, like we said, we saw those great, we saw a collection of great heavyweight fights where they could build new guys. Yep. They could, like, challenge the UFC's heavyweight division with their own division because the heavyweight division in the UFC is kind of hurting right now. You can yeah, bring, right now, you can, yeah. Yeah, you can bring these guys in. And so, hey, yeah, we've got some legitimately good people here. You guys better watch out. They could totally do that. They're not doing it. They're just like TNA. They just want to pick up the UFC cast-offs and try to make them champions. Now, we keep talking about Lesnar. Here's another thing about Strike Force and their heavyweights. They got, and by they I mean UFC rather, tons of new fans because of Brock Lesnar showing up the first time at least against Mir. There was tons of advertising on WWE websites and programming. Tons of wrestling fans got turned on to mixed martial arts because of that. Now, Strike Force was like, ooh, we got to do Bobby Lashley and Batista, and they just pretty much let that fucking go to the wayside. Now, Lashley is pretty much an intimating that he didn't re-sign with Strike Force because he didn't want to, didn't seem interested. However, even if that's the case, now all of a sudden, it's looking like Batista is going to have his first MMA fight in May. That's the target. But it's going to be in Bama, in the fucking UK, in England. Uh, I don't know. Maybe they they didn't pursue that because maybe they wanted him to have a warm-up fight first, I guess, a la Lesnar in K1 USA's first fight, and then he got signed to UFC. But man, how could they let Batista Lashley, I mean, it's not going to be a fucking no Garrick Ochoa match by any stretch of the imagination, I would think. But Lashley-Batista, I think, would have been a real key thing if they wanted to replicate 
bringing wrestling fans over. It's not even just like Lesnar fighting some guy to wrestling fans. This is two guys that they know, two huge heavyweights, two main event stars, and I think it would have been a huge fight that they kind of just let slip through their fingers. So I don't know what to say. I mean, every time it seems like Strike Force takes a step forward, there's one or two steps back. But uh, that show coming up on April 9th, at least, by star power alone, seems to have made up for the lack of the heavyweight fights, bringing back lightweight champion Gilbert Melendez, and they're going to have a welterweight title defense from Nick Diaz, and they're bringing back Shinya Aoki from Japan. Pfft, what a joke that guy turned out to be, I think. And Hagar Musasi, also dream light heavyweight champion. Both dream belts not on the line, but at least they've got somewhat stacked card to make up for that, and I'm sure we'll be talking about that when that happens, but we're done with mixed martial arts for now. So before we move on, I want to go to call Ryan from Massachusetts. Hello. Will pretty much said it like, we all did love Fedor, but we've just been hurt too much, Fedor. We can't take another loss, please. <laughs> I don't know if well, he should go and face Henderson because, I mean, two, fight, two losses in a row. I mean, even if he's Fedor, does that really warrant a title fight? But at the end of the day, it's Strike Force's decision, not the fans, so. But... Speaking of the fans, I mean, would you guys, this is to you too, Will, would you guys want to see that fight, though, if it does get lined up? Well, not with you, I mean, but that's about it. Like, you know, it's not a fight mm. that I think was going to tear that house down. It's just going to be, wow, well, I'm going to see Henderson and Fedor go out. Cool. That's Freak show it. fight, Ryan? Well, it's like what you said with uh, Batista Lashley. Sure, it's not going to be the fight of the century, but it's just something that people are going to be interested in. I mean, oh, this I, mean, been yeah, a I, mean I don't think it would be great, but I'd sure as fuck want to see it. Right, I mean, it's as far as like the quality of the fight itself, this would have been a better fight to have a couple of years ago. But as far as just the fact of saying these are two big, like big stars in MMA that never fought each other, like why not? I, I mean, the fact that it'd be a title fight is all I'm a little iffy on, but otherwise, go ahead. Why not? I'm surprised they didn't fight in Thrive. They're both hmm. dead shit done. Well, we are going to move on. And before we get to some of the latest happenings in pro wrestling, as far as shows go anyway, it's time for the news. Felipe Ham Lee, age 80, a former Mexican luchador, trainer, promoter, and Federal District Box y Lucha Commissioner, died on Wednesday, March 2nd of Natural Causes. Last week, Shark Boy asked for and was granted his release from TNA, while Jimmy Hart also departed the company to return to WWE. Ring of Honor World Champion and El Generico have both re-signed with Ring of Honor, and D.H. Smith of WWE has been named the assistant coach to Billy Robinson in the Scientific Wrestling Certification Program. Sean Waltman was taken to Jamaica Hospital in Queens, New York on Saturday night after landing chest first on a guardrail in a match against Kevin Matthews in the main event of Pro Wrestling Syndicate's Spring Break Showdown event in Long Island. Waltman sure to recover his though. Shad Kaspard, formerly of Prime Time in WWE, was arrested also on Saturday night in Columbus, Ohio, for resisting arrest and obstructing official business, though he and his wife, Siliana, allege racial profiling. Talk about living the gimmick. Just some of the stories over at WrestlingRoundTable.com. And we also have some poll results. Our latest poll really doesn't work anymore, which is why I had to take it down because of events that happened after the poll went up. And we will talk about what happened in TNA later on. But the question was, who should be in WWE's 2011 Hall of Fame? Of course, we know so far, Hacksaw Jim Duggan, Bullet Bob Armstrong, Sonny, Tammy Sitch, Shawn Michaels, and probably soon to be Abdullah the Butcher. But let's see what you people voted on. WrestlingRoundTable.com. 1% of the vote. A tie between Lex Luger. 1%? Come on. Should have been higher. And someone I threw in there, I guess, who would probably be in the celebrity wing, Regis Feldman. Come on. Where's your votes for Regis? Danny Hodge got 2% of the vote. Jim Ross has been pushing for Danny Hodge, and if there's an old-school guy who deserves to be in there, it would definitely be Danny Hodge. Wish he had gotten more. Kevin Nash got 6% of the vote. Oh, how much I would love that. Two dudes with attitudes going in the same year. 
Goldberg got 7% of the vote. Triple H may not agree, but I think there's a lot lesser people who accomplished a lot less than Goldberg who have already been in the Hall of Fame. So I think there should be no fucking problem putting Goldberg in in Atlanta. Ron Simmons got 9% of the vote, which was also a four-way tie with Ravishing Rick Rude, Jake the Snake Roberts, and Lou Fez. Funny thing that Ron Simmons is pretty much the only one alive in that grouping of four. I know Lou Fez and Rick Rude are dead, but Jake Roberts is like kind of technically dead at this point, isn't he? Maybe he's just like the Keith Richards of wrestling, and he'll just keep going on forever. Arn Anderson coming in third place with 10% of the vote. Dean Malenko. I mean, I love Dean Malenko, and he should be in, but second place? All right. Danny Hodge below Dean Malenko. Okay. Anyway, Dean Malenko, 11%. And the overwhelming favorite with 26% of the vote for who should be in WWE's 2011 Hall of Fame. Sting with 26% of the vote. Oh, well, well maybe Vader. next year. Vader. I'm sure well, if Vader. Stan Hansen goes in, Vader goes in at some point, too. Well, I doubt you have much to worry about there. Actually, when it comes to the Hall of Fame, I always, have, I always like think when I see a candidate, I'm thinking, is this guy better or worse than Coco Beware? Because I don't mm. know how the hell Coco Beware got in there. So that's the question I always ask myself. Like, is he better than Coco Beware? Then, yes, he should be in. Well, I'll tell you why. Because... The way they structure the Hall of Fame now is like a wrestling card. They have their main eventer, the top star of the year. Like, Bret Hart's a bigger name than Eddie Guerrero, so he's got to go in even though Guerrero just died. So he goes in last, and he's got the main event slot, and they have a whole bunch of mid-carders to fill it out. The Mae Youngs and the Black Jacks, those type of guys. And then you have your opening act, which, of course, would be Coco Beware. So I hope that answers your question. That's my theory anyway. For the most part, like, I've agreed with pretty much everybody they've ever put in. I just don't get – Coco Beware, I'm sorry. I just don't see why he was in. Like, I really had a hard time, like, trying to justify that. I still can't justify it too much. <laughs> but everybody else they've inducted, I've actually usually never had a problem with. All right. Let's take another call. Dominic in Staten Island, New York. Hello. Hey, guys. How's it going? It's going. What's on your mind? All right. Well, we're talking about the Hall of Fame, uh, well, uh, you guys are big Yokozuna fans, too, so uh, he he's not in, is he? No, he, no. He, you know yeah. what? That's funny. Someone said that exact line to me today. Yokozuna's not in it, is he? No, and I know that because if he was, I would fucking remember. Me too. Uh, obviously, you know, the Ultimate Warriors and the Macho Man, that goes without saying. Mm-hmm. I guess at one point in time, you could have said, hey, the Warrior, he's sort of like a one-hit wonder, but obviously... You know, good old Coco, so, and Hunky Tonk Man, I guess we could just go on and on about that. Um, well, Warrior Darling, and Hunky Tonk Man have both turned it down as well as Mr. T. Actually, Mr. T would actually make more sense as a celebrity guest than uh, as a celebrity mm-hmm. inductee than uh, Ref- William Refrigerator Perry would. Here's what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for the time, just because I would find it interesting. I'm waiting for the time when they start inducting ECW people, just mm-hmm. because I'm curious to see who would go in. Dreamer. Well, needless to say. But I just mean, like, would they go so far as to put in Shane Douglas Dreamer. and others uh, like Sabu or really instrumental, Raven, instrumental in really building ECW back then? I just want to get to the point where ECW is so far gone and so old. We're so past the point of expiration on that whole idea that it becomes okay to start inducting guys. Well, I guess that will boil down to whoever is not currently in TNA. <laughs> Isn't that how the Hall of Fame usually goes? So that leaves Sabu and Sandman wide open. Nicholas in Indiana, hello. It's time to start introducing some of these wrestlers from WCW and ECW because it's nearly 10th anniversary for both ECW and WCW uh, going on business. So I think it's time for them, them to do it because that's going to be a slap in the face if they don't do it. We talked about on the show before that there was a lot of rumors that this was going to be a WCW-themed Hall of Fame in Atlanta because of that, and I guess they just decided, fuck it, they're not doing it. But uh, maybe we'll get one. I'll just be happy with Nash or Goldberg. Or uh, Arn. Look, I'm sure all the agents will get in eventually, so you can relax, Corey. I'm sure Arn Anderson will be in there probably the same year as Mike Rotundo and Barry Windham. 
this definitely but, should be the, the year he should have got in, though. Double A should definitely get in this year. But I think he may, maybe he's waiting for Ric Flair to induct him. Probably. All right, Corey. Let's move on to Ring of Honor's ninth anniversary show, which aired live in iPay-Per-View from Chicago Ridge, Illinois' Frontier Fieldhouse. Aired on GoFightLive.tv, our partners. So you can probably still download the replay at GoFightLive when you're not watching Wrestling Roundtable on it, of course. And it's only fourteen ninety five. You can't beat that. Let's see if the card was worth buying, Corey. Let's see what you think. Now, you do have a review in full coming out probably later this week or so, but uh, let's give people a preview, I suppose. It opened with Davey Richards against Colt Cabana, and I enjoyed this because Colt Cabana has been, I think, rather interesting since the feud with Carino and Steen ended. He's broken away from that, and he's had an interesting string of matches. Now, Colt Cabana, obviously known for a lot more ha-ha, but he is a skilled technical wrestler as well, and I love the way he integrates them together. And I liked this because it was a change of pace from the Cabana matches we've been seeing lately, which have a lot of their funny moments, but this was a lot more in the vein of he had to turn it up a notch. He had to compete with Davey Richards on that level. He didn't really have the chance to goof around so much, let's say, in this match, and I thought it ended up being pretty good. What would you think, Corey? I think so, too. He definitely was more serious going into this match. I was surprised that they had it first match up, but he was definitely well, more Well, they probably serious. wanted to start off hot, and Chicago is Cabana's hometown, so they're, and Davey Richards is one of the top acts that they have, so there you go. Makes sense. Yes, it does. And, of course, Colt had to take this in a completely different direction, definitely more serious, because Davey doesn't fool around. I mean, he will kick you into next week if you're not careful. Davey himself brought a lot of fire into the match, and that was one hell of a match, I have to say. <laughs> kind of like Terry Funk used to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, not quite in the literal sense, but Davey was just on fire. He was so quick. I really love how Davey has this ability. He can catch you midair and turn your body into a submission. I just love that. He is so fun to watch. Difficult to draw, but fun to watch. TV and Richard just got his blue belt in jiu-jitsu recently, and he will be featured in the Grappling Kings when it comes out in 2027. So let's move on to the title match, which they set up with a impromptu challenge earlier on. Roderick Strong defending against Homicide in a hardcore match. Now, Homicide, a lot of Ring of Honor fans have been – critical of his matches lately in the negative sense anyway not constructively Homicide has been hurting a lot from a lot of injuries that have accumulated recently and he's hurting and feeling it every time do you think that this hardcore match was a way to work around that Corey did it work or are you one of the people that have been disappointed with Homicide since he's come back actually I haven't been disappointed with him at all and I didn't realize how badly injured he was until after the fight. The fact that he was able to work through all that pain, that's just incredible, considering all the injuries that he's got. I really liked where they took this match. The chair shots, I was a little bit, I I don't want to say wary of, because of what we hear about with concussions. But they did (laughs) a really great... When does Ring of Honor give a shit about that? (laughs) But they did a really great job with that. I also liked when Roderick gave Homicide the Three Amigos. I didn't expect him to pull that move out of nowhere. Definitely Roderick from... Strong really needs to stop this I'm stealing everybody's moves bullshit. It's getting really annoying. Yeah, but for the live crowd, they didn't seem to notice as much. I was surprised that Roderick was able to retain You were the live crowd, so you noticed. Oh, yeah. I was surprised that Roderick won. No disrespect to Roderick, but I thought Homicide really brought it in this match. I was very shocked when he didn't win. After the intermission was Sarah Del Rey and Mischief. These two had a match on Ring of Honor pay-per-view the other year, which people seem to like, think it was one of the best women's matches in Ring of Honor history. Probably not saying too much, but I've heard a lot of mixed reaction about this match. I thought it was okay. Nothing great, nothing spectacular, but what do you think, Corey? Mischief and Sarah Del Rey. The queen of wrestling. I was surprised at how short this was. Usually these two have longer matches. 
And, of course, Mischief's my favorite. What Sarah did in the match was really cool, too. She hoists Mischief up and just walks around with her body. And as she's walking, she's waving to people like this doesn't even happen. I just thought that was so interesting. Not a lot of wrestlers, male or female, take the time to play with the crowd like that in the middle of a move. And here's Sarah, who's always so serious, just pulling out this bit of humor. I thought it was a nice quality. It was a good spot, but a good spot solely a good match does not make. I was craving to see women wrestling, and I got what I was craving. These two always put on a fantastic match. Usually when people are craving women wrestling, it involves an apartment and smothering. <laughs> I've never heard you be so positive before. It's just so weird. I'm not used to it. <laughs> well, I went to a wrestling show instead of Little Princess Sports Entertainment, so I'm happy. There we go. Moving on to the males once again, Kings of Wrestling, defending the tag titles against the All Night Express of Kenny King, who I'm a huge fan of, and Rhett Titus. Usually, I'm not a fan of heel-heel matches. I think it's a bad idea. It doesn't really give the fans anyone to cheer. However, the Kings of Wrestling, I think, are probably the biggest draw Ring of Honor has right now. They're probably the most overact they have, despite their heeldom. I don't think that's a problem per se. If hey, if that's the way it is, run with it, I suppose. But All Night Express, uh, they've got some followers. I mean, they still do a lot of healer stuff, and people are into that, I suppose. But I think they like Kings of Wrestling that much more. So in this case, I think it worked. And, geez, Kenny King breaking out the Shooting Star Press, real impressive. And what do you think about how the heel-heel tag team title match turned out, Corey? Actually, this was a really great match. The crowd was really into it, especially any time Claudio did anything at all. And one thing I want to point out, Rhett has come a really long way since he started at the Arena of Honor Academy. You can really see in this match how much effort he's been putting into his training. He and Hero were almost evenly matched, and that is incredible to watch. I really didn't know who was going to win in this one. I was a little bit surprised that Hero and Claudio retained the belts. I was kind of rooting for Rhett and Kenny. But this was a fun match. I really love how far Rhett and Kenny have come. I mean, those two, they came so close to winning so often. If anybody really loves tag team wrestling, please watch this match. This is why you buy the pay-per-view. This match is the reason why other companies need to step up their tag team division because these two teams, they've got it. The TV champion, TV, what TV? Christopher Daniels defending against the former champion Eddie Edwards, two out of three falls, and it goes long, goes to a draw. Draw and drawn out, I guess, maybe. What do you think about the TV title, I guess, co-main event, Corey? Eddie Edwards is really getting a lot stronger He's got chops that remind me a lot of Bob Holly's chops. I mean, he took Christopher into the corner. <laughs> I'm sorry, Corey, but I don't I don't I'm just surprised that anyone remembered anything about Bob Holly's chops. You're kidding. No, he's not. I don't I don't get that either. You're kidding. Well, you know when people woo, will they? They're thinking of Bob Holly. The <laughs> <laughs> thinking, boo. Boo. <laughs> boo. I'm sorry, Corey, go ahead. <laughs> It's all right. Eddie Edwards' chops are just so amazing to hear when you hear them live. He just took Christopher into the corner and just... It was like a cartoon almost. Wrestling like a cartoon, I find that hard to believe. I was really scared, though, when Christopher took that sick landing. I'm glad that his doctor has since cleared him, because when he took that bump... from my You're talking about the bump at the end of the match. Yeah, it was sick. It was absolutely sick. I was not surprised at all that they stopped the match. I know the live crowd didn't really like that. Well, Corey, that was the finish. But that being said, he still did get knocked woozy. It was scary. That was very scary. That was one of those accidents, though. But the rest of the match I thought was really good. I thought that this was a match that showcased the better qualities of Eddie Edwards and Christopher Daniels' abilities. And I'm looking forward to see them go up against each other again when Christopher feels ready. I wasn't that big a fan of the match, but that being said, now that we're on the topic of Eddie Edwards, one thing that is really great to have seen 
is how much he's grown over the past couple of years, especially once he started wrestling in Japan. I mean, I remember years ago when this was a guy from Massachusetts, indie guy with cornrows looking like a little Teddy Hart or some shit. But you could really see his progression as a performer. The incredible injuries that he's wrestled through, broken his arm and hurt his shoulder and blah, 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 takes a whole lot of guts. And for what he might be lacking in character and mic skills, and I think he is, he definitely makes up for with his in-ring performance. And that's why people like him. That's why if there's an Eddie Edwards chant, that's what they're chanting for. Moving on to the main event, wrestling's greatest tag team, Haas and Benjamin, Charlie Haas and Shelton Benjamin, taking on the Briscoes in what I think would have been the dream match if people had heard Haas and Benjamin were coming in initially last year. I think that's probably what was on the tip of people's tongues. And it was for the number one contendership for the world tag team titles. Frankly, I'm shocked Haas and Benjamin are still with TNA, uh, still with Ring of Honor at this point. Just found out before we we went on the air that Shelton Benjamin had a dark match with WWE last night. Obvious racial joke in there, too. I'm just also shocked that Benjamin and Haas haven't gone to TNA yet. I mean, you would think TNA is so high on these former WWE wrestlers that they would have just chomped at the bit to reunite Team Angle, because Angle's still one of the top stars in their company. But we'll get to TNA later on. It looks like they're sticking with Ring of Honor, like they said in our blog last year. And we're all the better for it, because they've just been performing great match after great match. So what do you think, Corey, about the main event for the number one contendership against the Briscoes? I was shocked, actually, that Charlie Haas and Shelton Benjamin won. I thought for sure the Briscoes were going to win that one. But you are right, it was definitely a dream match when those two came in. And I thought it was a great match. It was a little bit shorter than what I would have anticipated. But these two teams, they just kept going at it and going at it, especially Charlie Haas. You can really see how much Haas has improved since he's left WWE. This was a really good match. If you take this match and the match with Claudio and Hero, I think those would be great matches to put on a Best of Ring of Honor Tag Teams DVD set. Those two matches solidify everything that's good and positive about tag team wrestling. There was also a four-way and a one-on-one with El Generico and Michael Elgin, but let's save that for the website. Corey, you've got a whole recap coming up this week on the ROH 9th Anniversary Show. What was it like live? Corey will go into more detail on the website. Another panelist, Will Vafides. Hello, Will. Finally! TLD is back on Wrestling Round Table Radio. How is California? Oh, wonderful. Great experience. Love when work sends you out. It was a wonderful time. But I'm here. I'm back. Talk some uh, wrestling, or I'm sorry, sports entertainment, and we already got to the wrestling part. <laughs> Abe from Augusta, Georgia. Hello, Abe. Hello, all you, by the way. I know the swerve. <laughs> if you saw the other, like, the recent um, episode you did, you would get that. Yes. Some people were pissed off, and those people have no fucking sense of humor. Too bad. And yes, we'll be doing a best and worst swerve sometime soon, for real. So relax, people. Lighten up. So what's on your mind, Abe? Well, I saw the one you did, as you posted today, about the he and Jim. Mm-hmm. That one he and Jim, in my opinion, that I like that nobody ever talks about, is the underdogs versus the body down from Survivor Series 1995. Mm-hmm. I think you said the awesome bomb that Jeanette did to skip, right? Yeah, it turns out that was uh, King of the Ring 96, not SummerSlam like I had thought. Yeah, but he did it at Survivor's 95 also. Uh, whichever. Either way, Marty Jannetty is the man, and that's the whole point of the story. <laughs> well, he just retired from that. was a good one. Then another one that um that was also pretty good, if you can find it, it's hard, but you can find it, is it's Ricky Steamboat versus Paul Ondor from 1993, Halloween Havoc. Mm-hmm. They missed, like, a lot of bronze outside the ring, but went back in the ring, did a lot of pure wrestling. They also had interference at the end. I don't want to give it away. <laughs> don't spoil it, Abe. And you can talk about that episode of Wrestling Roundtable. Show 49 is up in full. Now, the way we do it usually is that they're divided in segments by topic for the sake of conversation. It'd just be too jumbled, I think, if it was all posted in one video. We divide it into two topics on YouTube, two uploads, and you can watch the episodes in full on GoFight Live. You can also download them on iTunes. 
or WrestlingRoundTablePodcast.com. Our entire archive is over there. But if you want to support the show, please go to our shop, Pro Wrestling Respect DVDs, hosted by myself and Brett Midge Simonello, are over there, as well as the Wrestling Roundtable t-shirt, which is being modeled by Teresa. That is at WrestlingRoundTable.com. And if you're going to get anything online, if you're going to get anything at Amazon.com, you can get it through our Amazon store. It doesn't have to be wrestling or MMA. If you want to get fucking Buster Keaton poster, someone just ordered that. A lot of Buster Keaton fans, I guess, ordering through our Amazon store. But anyway, if it's on Amazon at all, please get it through our Amazon store at WrestlingRoundTable.com. Now, we mentioned TNA a few times here and there in passing so far, but I want to get into TNA proper right now because I started a thought last time, and it went like this. TNA are such biters, dot, dot, dot. And I got off on something else and lost track of my thought. Now, what I meant by that was we had just talked about the Rock's comeback on the Valentine's Day Raw and how awesome it was. Well, not too long after that, TNA puts out a press release, like anybody could do, press release. I always find that funny. But press release saying, Impact this Thursday will have the most shocking surprise ever. All right. The WCW Circa 2000 hyperbole for every fucking thing you do is bad enough. But the fact that these dipshits had the balls to say that after the fucking Rock came back, no less around the time when Triple H and Undertaker came back and the 22111 shit, wow. Nothing they could ever fucking do, period, would have even come close to matching the Rock coming back on Raw. So that just is what I meant about them being such biters, that in particular, to say nothing about the 3311 shit. Oh my god. <laughs> There was a whole thread, and you're laughing about it, Corey, because you know, there was a whole thread, I believe you might have even started it, but someone started a thread about all the Twitter backlash to Dixie Carter about this Bush League-looking shit. Look, we can shoot promos of someone's boots in a cape walking in the rain, too. Now, they were kind of smart to play off on the whole Sting rumors at the time, I guess, taking him off their website roster or whatever. I think he was a free agent, just resigned with them. Now, they're ripping off the 22111 shit that I think, at least in terms of marketing, has to be considered a success. They had a huge audience because of The Rock the week before, and they jumped up huge in terms of eyes watching the show, and then they present what was the blow-off to the hyped 22111 shit. I think a good job. We talked about it last time on Roundtable Radio. Then fucking TNA goes and does this 3311 shit. Down to the fucking font and transition graphic. Oh my god, they look so fucking pathetic copying everything WWE did there for their dark character. So I've just got a lot of venom for that sort of shit. It just looks so bad. And I'll just throw it to you guys. Let's go to the Wills first. Will Brooks, what do you think about the whole 3311 shit with Sting coming back and winning the title from Jeff Hardy. Anybody taking the title away from Jeff Hardy is a good idea to me, even if it's a 50 year old Sting, even if he is biting off the uh, Undertaker. But speaking of Undertaker, actually, I'm digging the Undertaker's Johnny Cash theme song now. Corey, I know you were doing round table, no one told you this, but never are you allowed to give a positive review about Bob Holly ever on the round table. <laughs> um, we should have told you that a long time ago. Sorry, that's awful. What? I never got that memo. I don't have to hear those two talks, thank God. If they would have waited two years, okay, I get that. But when you wait two weeks after that, especially that they built that up a very long time ago, they'd done that for about a month, and they do it in one week. This is where TNA has a big-time business problem where I don't know who thought of that. I don't want to know who thought of that because then I would probably diss them. But in the end, it's Dixie's head. It is the worst idea to steal something from someone else, especially when they just did it. A big surprise to me is, like, if John Cena jumped ship. That, to me, would be a surprise, something I wouldn't expect. But when they do that all the time, it's just annoying, and it makes me hate the product. I'm glad Sting won the title. They're flopping titles back and forth. So I'm not even remotely interested. I'm watching the YouTube clips on what happened. I'm not even watching the show. I just, oh, 
they got to do something. But the positive out of that show was that it was in a different arena. So I got to say, that's the only good thing I had to say about the show. It was a different vibe. It looks like it looked like a legit wrestling company. But I'm not happy with the way they did that. That was just a dumb idea. They should have just had them come out without any announcement at all. It would have been better that way. Well, yeah, the building in Fayetteville looked a lot cooler than the impact zone. Well, I don't know. It looked definitely fresher. It was a nice change of pace. The arena looked good, and it was nice. Maybe it's a good sign because they drew really well, and let's keep something in mind. As much as I'm ripping on them for this whole thing, they drew their second highest rating, like, ever for Sting to come back and title win. So maybe that just says more about Sting than them, but maybe the hype worked. I don't know. I just find it myself to be a huge letdown because... All right, Sting's a free agent. So unlike the Cena thing you said, well, this looked like it had a chance of happening. Sting finally in WWE. Oh, cool. It's not that I don't want to see Sting come back. I don't want to see Sting come back to fucking TNA again, much less win the belt again. It's been done. He didn't even leave that long ago. It's not like Triple H coming back after a year. Sting was just there a few months ago. So the whole thing just left me kind of sour. What do you think, Corey? Are we just poo-pooing on TNA's success because they did draw a huge number. Well, I'll give them this. The set was the best that they have had since Hogan got there. But the the one thing I'm surprised I you have... I think you could... Oh, well. All right. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off, but I think people just give Hogan and Bischoff way too much credit for things that happen in TNA. I don't think it's nearly as influential as people think. So I don't know if that's what you were implying or not, but... Oh, of course moving not. Moving to fight... My, moving to Fayetteville, North Carolina, was a good move, and maybe it's a good sign. Maybe they'll do it some more. The one thing I'm surprised you haven't gotten on them yet, when they first announced 3 three eleven, they said that this was going to be a live show. It wasn't. It was taped. And the second thing that really got me, not only did Sting win in a ridiculous-looking singlet I'd like to throw out there, but Dixie Carter was tweeting as he won the belt, days before the show went to air. If you're a promoter and you know your show is pre-taped, shut up. Don't don't tell me who wins. Don't tell me what's supposed to happen. That's what spoiler pages are for. Shut the hell up. Yeah, but Corey, maybe they're thinking like when Bischoff ordered Tony Schiavone to give away that Foley won the belt, and then Raw got a whole bunch of viewers, like half a million people tuned over to see it. Of course, it's two different companies, so it's giving away someone else's thing, but maybe they were going for a similar effect. If people knew, maybe they'd tune in, and maybe they were right because their numbers went up. Maybe so. That The finger poke of not quite doom would kind of work here. I mean, why not? At this point, you can replace the entire cast with Juggalos, and I don't think anybody would notice. But I still believe in that old-school rule that if you're a promoter and you know your shit is pre-taped, shut up. Shut up. I mean, don't don't run up to people on Twitter and say, hey, guess what? Steam's winning the title. Well, there's what? Why did you do that? You spoiled the surprise. Well, your key word from last time, Corey, and speaking of stuff that comes out of your mouth, we've heard Bob Holly and Juggalos tonight. What will happen next? Your key word from last time, Corey, was uncomfortable. I was uncomfortable watching that. <laughs> what about this whole Karen Angle slash Jarrett whatever and Jarrett wedding thing with Angle involved and whatever. Now, I don't want to say it made me uncomfortable because, I mean, I watched it, but it just made me think about people in wrestling are just kind of sick, aren't they? I mean, it kind of echoed, in a sense, to me, the whole Edge, Lita, Matt Hardy thing from years ago where there was obviously real-life relationships involved in this, but we're going to put that aside for the good of the company and put on a good storyline built off of it and blah, blah, blah. But it just seemed weird to me that I don't know the situation. I don't know how it happened. That's their business, not mine. But to turn this whole thing into a storyline, it's not unique. You see this happen a lot in wrestling. Do you think it says a lot about the mentality of the performers in wrestling, the show must go on sort of thing? Or do you think there should be more of a line to uh, draw, not to so too many threads of reality into the storyline. Like, do people really care that much that Jeff Jarrett ended up with Karen Angle and now she's getting her face shoved into cake? And not that I don't mind seeing white stuff all over Karen Angle's face, 
But I'm just saying that the whole thing just come across weird. What do you think, Corey? Parts of this storyline have come across as weird and uncomfortable, specifically the children involved. But I'm going to give TNA this one. Kurt Angle had the most serene and happy look on his face when he began wielding the axe. After Karen and Jeff did this five-minute uncomfortable speech about things that Kurt Angle can't do in bed with Karen and things that Jeff Jarrett does do in bed, P.S. I can't look at my action figures anymore, I, I just love that whole bit where they said, you may now kiss the bride, and Kurt looks down and he takes the axe and as he's swinging the axe and destroying the set, I almost expected there to be a theme behind him, like, da-da-da-da-da, oh my god, he's got an axe, da-da-da-da-da, chomp, 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 da-da-da-da-da, because that's the kind of relaxed look on his face that he had. <laughs> you mean a Shining-esque Mr. Torrance sort of look? I suppose that's what it is. I haven't seen that movie before. He just Ugh. Has- he had, okay. he had this calm, happy expression as he was laying waste to the entire set and threatening to kill people. I just thought that was so beautiful. You need to turn the anime off and start watching some fucking Stanley Kubrick, Corey. No, it scares me. <laughs> wow. Anime fucking frightens me, so we're even. <laughs> anyway, let's move on to Raw. Cena's big retort promo to The Rock. Was it a first-round knockout, Will Vafidez? No. Okay. Will Brooks. First how... round was, was creative, and I liked it. The second one was really, really weak, because I'm like, dude, you just said the exact same thing like two weeks ago. You couldn't come up with anything a little new. So I was really actually left kind of flat after that. What do you think about Austin's big comeback? His comeback is going to, I guess, continue with WrestleMania 27, refereeing Jerry Lawler's first WrestleMania match against Michael Cole, also in his first WrestleMania match. Well, you don't hear it for him as much. And JBL coming back in the same segment as a surprise. Oh, two former world champions from Texas coming back in Dallas. What a treat. Will Vafidez, how did the Austin segment go? That one I definitely loved. I'm an Austin fan, so this was definitely nice to see. I like the JBL. That was a little, now that's a surprise to me. See, that, that to me is more of a surprise. I didn't see JBL coming out. So mm-hmm. that to me is more of an impact than Sting coming back. We're doing a 3-3-3 promo. I love the fact that Michael Cole thinks that this match is the main event of Mania. I think that's one of the funniest things that he keeps doing that. So I thought that that's kind of funny. I like the, how this match is being built up. I think it has a lot more meaning than probably most matches on the card. Because this is something we've been waiting to see for a long time. Then Stone Cold just coming out and stunning him. Kind of letting him be who he is. Not really like, uh, like he was last year with Bret Hart and Vince, so he got a little bit more leniency this time. Stuck up the middle finger a few times, but the camera blocked it, which was smart, but still, he did it. Yeah, I know, so, pearl necklace references and middle fingers. Oh, it's yeah. like a throwback. Well, I, know, I know they're going more PG-13 now. I, I think they should with Mania, especially with all these Attitude stars coming back. You know, mm-hmm. they got to let them talk, let them be who they are. It's that That's just who they are. That's what we remember them from. I love the segment. I like the idea of Stone Cold as the referee. I think this is going to be a very entertaining entertaining match. I think it's going to be fun to watch, and I definitely love the segment. I think it does what the storyline needs to progress. We're going to progress on to another topic, and it will be the follow-up to the Q&A we did on our season finale last year. Submission round four. Myself, Chris Harris, Rodney Lacan, and Will Brooks were on that one, but, Corey, you, needless to say, were not, and Will Vafitas, you were not either. But before we get to those questions, I want to go to another call. Jason Murdoch in Brooklyn. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? What is on your mind, Jason? Raw segment. <laughs> I don't. I don't got really no enthusiasm, no pump up for WrestleMania. It was so many stuff they could have done. I don't want to be one of the bitches people to bitch and complain what they could have did or what they should have did, because I'm not Vince McMahon, I'm not running a billion dollar industry, but at the same time, it's more an image, it's like there, it's, it's more of an image in the actual matches, like Miz versus John Cena, like, that's, okay, that, that seems like, okay, these two popular PG wrestlers, let's see if they can draw, 
Edge versus Berto Del Rio. It seems like a, soup, a SmackDown versus Raw special event. It's like an anniversary. It doesn't seem like a um, a WrestleMania. Like, there's not one standout match. Like he said, the the best build-up is Cole and the King. It's the only one that's been building up for months. Ooh. You know, that's, that's pretty much true because everything else has been thrown together. And there's no real match unless you have the money in the bank. I don't know if they're going to do that. They're not going to do that. Other than that, then what, what, what else is there? They had the stipulation of no holds barred, the Triple H versus The Undertaker. Come on. Are you going to order WrestleMania? Um, I'm debating. I'm debating. Okay. Mm-hmm. You order WrestleMania because it's the biggest show of the year. They always have yeah, something big. That's why I want to order it. The Rock is on the show. He hasn't been around wrestling for seven years. He's going to yeah. be on the biggest show in the world. That sold WrestleMania to me because I'll get to see an appearance from him, and he's going to confront the guy that's basically been bullshitting him on Twitter and online. And The Miz and John Cena is a good WrestleMania match to me because it's the first time these two have actually fought on a big level, not in, like, matches that have been made cards. So what other match would you have done that could have sold you to have that WrestleMania, and I'm not I'm, from anybody. John who's on Cena the versus Rock Undertaker. Team, John Cena versus Undertaker. You think they might save that for next year when it's this 20 and 0 match? You ever thought maybe they could mm-hmm. save that to be a big? Why not? Why do it now? What would what, what would be the difference now? John Cena would just get buried by Undertaker. There'd be absolutely no reason that's to even true. watch that's this. True. What's going to happen? So well, that's why yeah, I guess you. I guess you're right. You're right. Yeah, right. So my whole thing on that is the reason why they're doing Triple H Undertaker for a second time because their first time was pretty damn good. Their second time yeah, was. Good. I'm kind of in the middle of you two because Cena Undertaker and I guess people were just talking about Sting Undertaker potentially. There are a couple matches that might be a little bigger, but with Austin, Rock, Trish, a lot of these old names combined coming back, maybe Michaels will be in there. Obviously he's for Hall of Fame, but he might be on the show. I think this is actually kind of a decent card for what their lineup is right now. Del Rio winning the belt, Cena Miz for the title, and the undercard is shaping up to be pretty decent as well. I never really cared for Money in the Bank at WrestleMania myself, and that was usually a hit or miss match, mostly miss for me, so I'm not missing that. But if they do Sheamus and Danielson one-on-one for the U.S. title, good. If they get Trish in some mixed tag or whatever. The only thing I need is in that tag match that they're setting up with the core against it's supposed to be Big Show, Kane, Christian, and Kofi for some fucking reason. Two of these things are not like the other. Nash should be in that fucking match and I'll be happy. This uh, It's turning out to be a pretty decent card, I think. Let's get back on track and get back to submission round four's Q&A. Want to get some other opinions on what we talked about. The first question from Ray in Yonkers, New York, is, with the PG era in full effect, do you think WWE should drop matches like Hell in a Cell or Elimination Chamber since blood plays a major role in adding realism to that match? Corey, what do you think about that? The main issue isn't so much the blood. It's the overall booking that's to blame for why these last cage matches haven't been so good. I mean, think about this. Do you think there's just too many of them and done too often? Well, that's one problem. The other problem is this. Think about any of the WWE or WWF cage matches. Any one. What's the number one thing you remember? The blood, right? Well, Not really. Not for me. See, I'm not a big blood guy. Neither am I. Like, like blood doesn't make or break a match to me. Because people always say, well, blood is a the way it should be in a fucking steel cage match because it's the big blow-off for a feud. That's why they're in a cage, and it's got to be bloody because it's hardcore, this and that. But everyone always says that the greatest cage match of all time is Bretton Owen at SummerSlam, and guess what? No blood. When WWE mentions these matches, though, what's the first thing they bring up? They bring up the carnage. They bring up the black and white filter for the (laughs) replay. Yeah, and all you hear is Jr. screaming, The Carnage King! The Carnage! You don't actually see any clips of the wrestling itself. I think that these matches can still go on in the PG era of WWE. We just need to book them stronger. Let's not have blood be the main focal point, 
and certainly let's speed it up because Seamus and Randy Orton should never be locked in a cage again. I think we can all agree on that. No, I don't agree with that at all because actually their match is pretty good, not compared to other Hell in the Cell matches, but the reason why we do a Hell in the Cell, they have a purpose, to keep two people inside the ring and everyone out, just like they do in a cage match. It's not meant to have blood. That means two men, the only way they can settle their issues is being in a Hell in the Cell kind of a match, to knock off the whole feud, or at least it used to be. And as far as the Elimination Chamber goes, I like the concept of the Chamber because I think it adds on to what the Royal Rumble is, and it adds on a factor that we can see a new world champion and we can crown number one contender from it because that match is pretty tough to win considering the elements that are involved. So mm-hmm. I think that I like Chamber in its position, I like Hell in the Cell in its October because it fits the Halloween-type theme. And they only do it once a year now, so they don't do it that often like they did in, like, 98. They did what? How many Hell in the Cell matches in a year? They're building these matches up to sell pay-per-views. That's why they're doing it. Now, they may not be hitting right now, but to me, it's better to see this only during pay-per-view time. You don't you don't deserve to get these on Raw. You don't deserve to get them on SmackDown. They're, you're going to buy the pay-per-view to see the match. Not if you're Vince I mean, Russo. Well, if you're Vince Russo, then you just fuck up TNA. Give that shit away for free every week. That's my opinion of it. It's meant to settle some feuds, and, and Elimination Chamber is meant to be a building point for some for either the belt or to build someone up for a number one contendership. Next up is Aaron from Temple Hills, Maryland. He had asked, what do you think was the best WCW pay-per-view of all time? I had mentioned, of course, Great American Bash 89 and Spring Stampede 99. But Fall Brawl 2000, I thought, was a really good show from start to finish. WCW, not really known for having too many great shows from beginning to end, certainly in the post-Hogan era, maybe before that. (laughs) They're more known for having individual matches, I would think, and storylines. But as a collection, eh, not so much. So Fall Brawl 2000 ain't too bad an example of a good show from start to finish. Do you have one in mind, Will? World War III, where Bret Hart and Diamond Dallas Page was the main event for the U.S. title. That was, that was 1998, and I wasn't too thrilled with that match. Well, that one, I, I, I liked it. That was the only WCW tape I actually ever got, so that's why mm-hmm. I liked it. Nash was built up pretty well. You know, I liked the tease with Hall and Nash like coming together. You know, mm-hmm. I, I mean, it wasn't that. I mean, the wrestling was still pretty good on the card, but mm-hmm. you know, I, I love World War Three. I always loved that concept. It was always fun to watch it. I was a fan of that one. That's the only one I ever ordered, so that's why it's the only one I could say is my favorite. Other than probably Bash at the Beach in 96 because of the outcome in the end. but mm-hmm. Donnie Durden on YouTube, that's the username, said, Underneath our video, Chi-Town Rumble is my pick for best WCW pay-per-view. The Midnight Express versus original Midnight Express in a Loser Leaves Town match was fun. Sting versus Butch Reed, and of course, Flair versus Steamboat. When I think of WCW, I think of this era as opposed to the NWO days. Funny that he said that, because that would be NWA days as opposed to NWO days. Zach Fellows in Shropshire, England. Hey, he writes our recaps. He asked, do you think that a wrestler adding a hold or move to his moveset every once in a while helps improve match quality? And I cited examples of Colt Cabana and Austin Aries. So what do you think, Corey? Absolutely. Even if it's just one move... One different move can change the overall pace of a match dramatically. That's why guys like Jerry Lynn and The Undertaker are so captivating. Just when you think you know everything that they can possibly do in the ring, one of them will pull out something absolutely new that you never thought of. Yeah, I would actually go with The Undertaker reference was good because like, when they did the new submission hold, I love I loved that he added that to his arsenal. Uh, it's something different. Uh, I definitely think it does. I know when I wrestle, I do have to pull out something brand new once in a while to kind of refresh my character. So I I definitely agree with that. You know, it it all depends on the character sometimes, you know. I mean, like, The Miz, I know, like, is my most recent thought that he's had a lot of moves in the last year. There are people who definitely need to add moves once in a while to refresh themselves. Jamie and Lindsay, Ontario, Canada, which... I'll be returning to Ontario, Canada soon for UFC. Anyway, he asked, in MMA, do you prefer a cage or a ring? And it seemed the overall consensus was a cage. And I can't say I disagree, even though I'm a fan of pride. The cage definitely distinguishes MMA from other forms of combat, boxing, wrestling, etc. And it's really just become identified with, I guess the mainstream would call it ultimate fighting, but mixed martial arts. And being that I've shot two MMA shows, it's easier to shoot than through a ring, I'll tell you that much. So what do you think, Will? Cage or ring in MMA? I like the cage. I like the idea of something different. I mean, we've seen rings for a long time. It's nice to see something that's a little bit different of an atmosphere. 
you know, mm-hmm. which is why a lot of people probably said, well, I like TNA because it's a six tired ring, which was a unique concept that we don't see too much, even though it's around. I do like the cage. I, I, I prefer a cage. Gavin in Arbroath, Scotland had asked, what independent or international wrestlers would you like to see in Ring of Honor? I had mentioned that I think Ring of Honor dropped the ball huge a few years ago with not bringing in Mystico when he was in the news because he was rumored to be going to WWE close to signing. I thought since he was hot at the time, that would have been a coup to have gotten Mystico, and now he's Sin Karas in WWE. But I also mentioned Prince Devitt, who is the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Champion in New Japan right now, and seems to be doing really well over there. Prince Devitt <laughs> might have some trouble with Ring of Honor fans. It seems like Ring of Honor rosters ticked away at his moveset like vultures, and they're more known for that now than he is. But there is a name that I've been forgetting to bring up whenever this sort of thing comes up when we did our show on cruiserweights in the first season, which is available on iTunes. If you go to the search box, type in Wrestling Roundtable, because there's so many shows in the first season that are only available there. People say, well, why don't you do a show on tag teams or best and worst finishers? We did, people. It's in the first season, and it's only on Wrestling Roundtable podcast right now. So check that out, and thanks, Will, for updating those archives. But there's a name that I forgot to bring up then because we were talking about more or less high flyers in the Cruiserweight talk. And this time again, I forgot to bring him up, but I've been dying to mention him on the show. He wrestles as many different names and many different gimmicks. El Blazer. But he, his name is Takuya Suji. Please do a YouTube search on this guy. One of the most amazing high flyers I've ever seen. I would love to have seen him come into Ring of Honor. Don't know what he's up to right now. But what do you think, Corey, for indie wrestlers, because you do go to a lot of indie shows, or international wrestlers that you'd like to see go to ROH? I'd really like to see Sawa make a Ring of Honor appearance. Well, he's tell a- us who that is, because... You know, a lot of fans may not be familiar with independent or international wrestlers. He's a heavy set Japanese wrestler who incorporates a lot of MMA moves. He's super tough. He's had a couple of matches for Evolve. This is one of those guys that can eat, steal, and shit a BMW. This guy is super tough. I like Another... how he'll say shit, but not say fat. <laughs> Chuck Taylor. He really has been doing quite well. He's been going all over the place, not just in Chikara. He's been wrestling for Dragon Gate and a whole bunch of other places. And people love him because he can pull out a lot of the moves that Davey Richards does and then flip the script and be a total comedy act the next minute. And another tag team that I wish could have come to Arena of Honor, because one of them recently retired, are the British Lions. I really was hoping they'd come in. I know they wanted to try out for Ring of Honor at least once. The British Lions wrestle mostly in Florida. These two would be great against the Bravado Brothers or Dark City Fight Club. Esteban in San Jose, California asked, and I'm sure it's a mystery what Corey's answer will be, if you ran WWE, who would you put on top? Kofi Kingston. I'm glad you mentioned him and not what we expected, of course, Daniel Bryan because that was most people's answers on the table. I, of course, said Cena, and I said, as much as I dislike The Miz, he should be champion, as I've said many times, but I think they really need to fucking shit or get off the pot with Kofi Kingston and John Morrison. Stop jerking around with these two guys. If you want to fucking make the main eventers, let's do it already. It's been a couple years that they've just been like... Moving up a little bit and then back down. Moving up a little bit and back down. Let's do something with them. If they're going to make it, just give them the chance. So, anyway, Corey, as you were saying, Kofi Kingston. I absolutely agree with you, Eric. Kofi can hold a crowd the exact same as Cena. He can move like nobody's business. He's versatile. He can do everything from high-flying to basic mat technician moves. He's charismatic. He can hold a storyline like nobody else. And the crowd just goes nuts for this guy every time he comes out. The pop is huge, and his merchandise always sells out at my local Walmart. I think I would definitely put him at the top. I like the Miz's position right now. I think it's very good. We definitely need to have a a very strong face push, and I think Morrison is the right person for that. I see a lot of his merchandise being sold. The guy's got something that really connects to the fans, and he's the kind of guy I would see as the next face to push in the company, or even Christian, because I think Christian can also can pull it off now that he's been gone for a while. I think a lot of people miss him and realize how very talented he is. So I think we need to start getting some face pushes. We've had some heels over this last year with Sheamus and Wade Barrett. Kane got a little bit more of a run this time. We need to see some faces uh, getting up there a little more often. I think the heels had a big year for 2010. 
I think 11's got to be the faces uh, moving up like Morrison and Daniel Bryan and Kofi. Version 0.5 in our chat room said William Regal and Dolph Ziggler. But you can join our chat room as well on WrestlingRoundTable.com anytime. Stephen in Yorkshire, England asks, who is your favorite wrestling family? Now, most people said the Hearts, to no one's shock or surprise. I said the Funks, but I'd also like to throw out the Rhodeses in there, because Dusty, Dustin, and Cody all are individually good. What I've said about Goldust or Dustin Runnels on the show before is that what's awesome about him is that he really established himself outside of his father. Now, it took WWF's makeover in 1995 to do it, and really, any other time in any other promotion, it hasn't really worked. He's reverted back to Dustin Rhodes and Seven and whatever the fuck else TNA made him. And never really worked as much as Gold Dust. But he distinguished himself, aside from just being in his father's shadow, as Dustin Rhodes. In fact, it's really funny watching his initial run in WF in 1990 because he was just really doing a fucking impression of his dad. Ted DiBiase, Virgil, blood is thicker than water! And then Cody Rhodes, he's really starting to branch out with this dashing gimmick. That's another match that I think is good on WrestleMania's card. If him and Mysterio have a match one-on-one, even if it's hair mask, even better. I like that there's a feud, because this is the way they used to do it. There's a feud that has some good heat and some real motivation that doesn't involve a title. And I think he's doing real well with the dashing gimmick. So I think the Rhodes, three generations, and they're all doing well. So... What do you think, Will? What's your favorite wrestling family? You know, it's funny. Not a lot of people would actually mention the Rhodes family, and, I, and I'll agree with that. I think that definitely they're three different personalities. You wouldn't associate them if you put them next to each other. or You know, you wouldn't even think that they're related in a way. So mm-hmm. um, I'm going to say the Hearts, obviously. Bret Hart got me into wrestling, and I've followed the Hearts ever since. I but just between say- Bret Owen and Bulldog alone, how many classic matches are there? To say nothing of Jim the Anvil and all the other Hart brothers and Stampede days. I always loved Keith. I thought Keith and Brett were actually pretty good together. I just some matches with them. They were really good. Stu alone is a legend in wrestling. I think it's an even tie between the Funks and the Hearts. Those Blue Blazer weird. in our chat room mentioned the Samoans. I don't think that should count because there's like a million of them. Yeah. <laughs> but, what about uh, the Von Erics? Well, make the case. I think that the Von Erichs should also be considered. I'm surprised more people don't know about them, specifically Carrie Von Why are Eric. you surprised? They were regional stars in one part of the country in the age before YouTube and the Internet. Yep. Well, they, they were extremely good, though. <laughs> With most of those matches going to YouTube now, there's very few excuses to not see them, specifically Carrie Von Eric, who was the absolute best of his family. Graham from Toronto, Ontario, Canada, who posts on our message board a lot, asks, what elements of UFC should pro wrestling be stealing to freshen up the product? Now, some people may not be of the mindset that they should be looking to MMA at all. They seem to be doing okay on their own WWE right now, but that is their pre-WrestleMania role. They're down in other areas, up in some, but point being, what should WWE be taking from UFC, if anything? And I think... It was more of a marketing answer that we gave, the way they hype fights, the way they build it up, because in a reverse good way, I like the stereotypical screaming wrestler from the 80s stuff, although that's kind of missing today due to the lack of cocaine. But one thing that I do like about mixed martial arts, specifically UFC, is that there is no prejudice in terms of who gets pushed or who gets marketed a certain way. For instance, what I mean by that is that what I really loved about Sin Cara's signing, which I'm sure many of you saw, is that they made it a big deal. It was so cool in the sense that they signed a legit big name from foreign promotion, foreign land, and made it a big deal. It wasn't like, here's stereotypical Orient Express or Mexico type shit. It was a big deal. It reminded me of when they brought in Taka Michinoku 13 years ago. And you know what? I think if you present people as if it's a big deal, they'll buy it. That's why I made the argument in the first season, if foreigners can get over in America, you're telling me that if they sign fucking Kenta from Noah and give him the spotlight, he won't get over just because he can't speak English or some dumb shit? That's what I love about mixed martial arts. They never have to worry about someone coming out on lawnmowers or doing some stupid gimmick just because they're from another country. They're all these stereotypes and shit. So at least in that sense, they're a lot more worldly. Hillary Clinton was just... uh, 
ripping on pro wrestling for not being the best representative of the world, and I can't say she's wrong with a lot of the shit they do. So what do you think, Will? Is there anything that WWE should look to UFC for? Well, one thing I you, they used to do was when they had the Raw SmackDown pay-per-view separate, you had to wait like a month or two before the Raw feuds would actually come to a close. Yes. So I kind of missed that. I kind of missed that, but then again, the pay-per-views weren't selling, and I could see why, because there's some stars missing, and they might need them. So I, I do miss that those days that you would wait two months to see a feud actually end. Uh, yeah, it's, like it's a, a very big difference if you only see a guy fight a couple times a year versus Randy Orton and seen his never-ending matches yeah. every fucking pay-per-view yeah. and every week. One thing I would love them to do, you marquee the match that's going to sell the ticket. Mania, like John Cena versus Miz, underneath like the actual logo. I think like that kind of concept works. I think the idea of saying Cena, Miz, you know, two out of three falls underneath the, like, the logo, to me that sells it. I mean, you know what the main event is then, and then you know... Mm-hmm. You're going to check out the rest of the card. All right. Well, we only have a few minutes left, so a couple more quick ones. Anthony in Bristol, England. What was the best job a commentator has ever done calling a match? I, of course, said Jim Ross at the King of the Ring 98 calling the Hell in a Cell with Mankind Undertaker, but I have to throw in Bobby Heenan throughout the entire Royal Rumble match in 92. He was such an instrumental part and such an entertaining part. Really helped the story, and it made it very memorable. So, Corey... What do you think was uh, the best job a commentator ever did? Dave Prezak, Ring of Honor, Better Than Our Best, April 1st, 2006, during the Colt Cabana Homicide Street Fight. Dave really captured the chaos and emotion of that match like no other. The delivery of his commentary was fantastic, especially when the chairs started flying. He really did a great job on that one. 92 Royal Rumble was also a good one, but SummerSlam 1991 with Roddy Piper, Gorilla Monsoon, and Bobby Heenan was just so hilarious to watch. That was one of my favorites. I can't believe she brought up a Ring of Honor reference compared to everything we've had in wrestling history. Yeah, really. Abe, who calls into the show, as he did earlier in Augusta, Georgia, asked, what is the most underrated rivalry in the 90s in either WWF or WCW? Tillman versus Goldust. I loved their feud. That was Certainly it wasn't for the matches. I loved their feud. I loved their matches. I loved everything about that. I thought that was the... The main storyline of 97, I was very disheartened when Brian Pillman passed away because he was so good. <laughs> Not at that point. He was in so um, much fucking pain, shooting up so much drugs to get through those matches. The promos were great, but uh, I don't have fond memories of that, aside from when he brought out Marlena as a hooker. Will Vafides. Rick Flair versus Roddy Piper, actually, I thought was a very good feud. It never really even had an ending. I thought that one was actually very good. Um, mm-hmm. I love how they played off each other. The 92 Rumble with Roddy and Ric Flair were in the ring by themselves. That was like the crowd went nuts for that. So that that feud was really great. and never really had a proper ending. So that's yeah. a shame, but that was one of my favorites. Graven and DDP in 98 WCW was very underrated. I thought they had some interesting promos going together. Of course, there was the hint of Jake the Snake getting involved, which never amounted to anything. DDT being the same finish with Raven, but... In and of itself, they had some really great matches, and even the three-way with he who we do not speak of, but the cage match blow-off, where Canyon was revealed underneath the Mortis mask, I thought was really good, too. And I think Lex Luger, in the pre-NWO days, when he was feuding with the Giant in WCW, they had some good chemistry. It was almost, in a way, like the new generation version of Hogan Andre, but I thought those two had some good chemistry, even as a tag team a little later on in the next year, but... That little series of matches they had just when the NWO was just uh, about to start was pretty good. But that's going to wrap it up for this time on Wrestling Roundtable Radio. We'll be back in a couple weeks, and we'll be discussing UFC 128 in Prudential Center in New York, which we will be attending, along with TNA Victory Road. So for the panel of Will Brooks, Will Vafides, Coriander Ake in Chicago, and all the callers, stay tuned on WrestlingRoundtable.com and join us next time, and you will be winning... And you thought we were going to get away without a Charlie Sheen reference on this show. 